Let me read to you a passage from the third chapter of St. Mark's Gospel, verses 31 to 35. It's the Gospel for Tuesday of the third week in ordinary time. St. Mark writes, Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. That's from Mark chapter 3 verse 31 to 35. Let's think for a moment on what our Lord said about being his brothers and sisters. You know, a distinctive feature of the religion of Islam is its catch cry, there is no God but Allah. Further, that Allah alone is great. I introduce the Islamic insistence on the one God and its unrelenting opposition to idolatry in order to bring into focus man's images of God. More than anything, we ought to think of the image which God has revealed he wants us to have of himself. That is to say, we ought to think of the manner and content of God's revelation of himself. It is a progressive revelation of himself as tender and merciful love. With respect for the strengths of important features of Islam, the Christian does not regard it, strictly speaking, as part of the historical revelation. That revelation subsists in Judeo-Christian religion. The Christian regards Islam as basically natural, drawing heavily on and enhanced by elements of that historical revelation which was granted to the prophets and definitively completed and fulfilled in the person and teaching of Jesus Christ, the Son of God made man. A very distinctive feature of this revelation is its gradual character. One authority on both religions, Christianity and Islam, is Jacques Jomier, a Dominican priest, in his book, The Bible and the Quran, page 92, writes that there is in the Bible a whole religious aspect that has no equivalent in the Quran, the historical aspect properly so called, that of the progressive revelation of God's love for his people through all the vicissitudes of history, with the growing awareness of the grievous character of sin considered as an offence against God's love and the needs of all mankind, that of the poor of Yahweh. End of quote. Regarding sin, for instance, the Quran ignores the great lesson of the exile on the seriousness of sin. As a matter of fact, as the Bible appears in the Quran, it is only certain passages of the Pentateuch and certain bits of the Gospel that feature and, well, seriously distorted, the Christian will have to say. I mention Islam only to bring out the distinctiveness of historical revelation. In the Quran, there is no progressive revelation of the mystery of God over the course of time. Whereas in the Bible, God as the Lord of love is progressively shown. He is gradually revealed as God with us a husband to his people. This revelation reaches its highest point in the person and teaching of Christ. This brings us to our Gospel that I read earlier. The mere fact of the Incarnation is a wonder, of course. God became man, truly man, in order to be with us and to share with us his life of love. It is the greatest revelation of divine love. God so loved the world, St. John writes, that he sent his only Son not to condemn the world, 
which might have been expected, granted its sin, but to save the world. Without having pursued the matter exhaustively, I suspect that the dogma of God being a God of infinite love is peculiar to the Judeo-Christian revelation. The Gospels are full of it. In our Gospel scene today, Jesus, mother and brother arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Mark chapter 3 verse 31 to 35. If the assumption is that Jesus Christ is at most a prophet, then of course this statement of his is not especially significant. It simply expresses the view of a holy man who regards those who do God's will as especially close to him. If the assumption, if the belief, is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and equal to the Father, then it is a statement that gives us a tremendous revelation of the attitude of God to us, his creatures. If we endeavour to do his will, we become brothers and sisters of the incarnate God. This is part and parcel of, and all of a piece with, the mounting revelation of God as a God of love. In the Old Testament, prophets, he speaks of himself as Israel's husband. The most wonderful thing in human experience is love, and it is this which is the distinguishing feature of God's revelation of himself, but to an incalculable degree. Here in the passage I read earlier, in the person of his incarnate Son, God wishes us, us men and women, to become his brothers and sisters, as it were. Let us ponder on the scene of the gospel that I read earlier, allowing our Lord's words to light up our grand vocation. We are called to an eternity of intimate communion with the living intimate God, the living infinite God. We ought to give glory to God daily for his, for his goodness. Let our prayer be, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. We give most glory to God when we accept with our whole heart his revelation of himself and act on it. This means hearing his word of love and entrusting ourselves to it entirely.